I'm the steward. So this will be the first item I'll be reviewing. It's a, a book by Norman Angel called Let the People Know. I hope you can see it from here. Um, it's a bit old. It's uh, originally published 1942. This version is 1943. You can see there, January 1943. Published in Canada, although it's by Viking Press, which is a New York company. Right. Uh, it's a bit old, and uh, this was its original dust jacket, actually. Let the people know. These plain answers to the questions that confuse us are needed for victory in the war today and in the peace tomorrow. Exciting. So you can see, you can read a bit here, pause if you like. So, Viking Press, New York. And it asks to donate to the U.S. Armed Forces this book after you've done. You can see Norman Angel. He was born in England, and uh, he was actually a journalist in France, and later came to America and then back to Britain. He was uh, he became famous for publishing uh, a book called *The Great Illusion* in around 1910 or so, which uh, basically his thesis was that. Um, there will not be war, or rather, war will be not nearly as destructive in the future, in the future from that time, right? So, um, because Europe was more economically integrated, and thus, uh, war would be economically disastrous for all parties involved, right? Of course, he was wrong about, you know, World War One and then World War Two. so, even still, though, he was uh, a prominent, semi-prominent socialist, Labour MP in Britain. Uh, he later won the Nobel Peace Prize in uh, 1933 for his uh, contributions to peace. And even during World War II, he was always sort of rooting for peace. And um, Let the People Know is actually not one of his famous books. I think I'm the first person to actually properly review it, more than like five sentences about it, for like 50 or maybe even 70 years. So, uh, let's have a look, shall we? Norman Angel, let the people know, Viking Press. It's a pretty good book, but I bought it for like $2 uh, at a garage sale near Hamilton, Ontario. Here's a little introduction from a sort of book club thing. It opens up like that uh, by Henry Seidel Canby, who I don't know who that is. Well, essentially what happens is, unlike his other books, which are more academic in tone, uh, this one is specifically made for uh, John Q. Public of America, and uh, addressing... Uh, here it is. The aim of this book is to present and answer the questionings, uh, doubts, and misgivings about the war, its causes, origins, and outcome, which are, the pr which are present in the minds of immense numbers of average mainstream Americans, even when not expressed for fear of being regarded as defeatist or unpatriotic. Because at the time, America had just entered into the war after Pearl Harbor, well, relatively recently. And even still, uh, uh, there were a lot of, uh, the general public, a lot of them were, um, how do you call them? So they had their misgivings about the war. Why should we fight a war in, in Europe? And essentially, Norman Angel gives the, uh, the case for why we should fight in World War II, or America. Hey? John Citizens put, qu puts questions which are still in most people's minds, but which many dislike to ask. He explains why he ought to have an answer the plain, busy citizen can understand. So, much of the book is actually this John Citizen character, who goes on a little rant at the start of the book, and then Norman Angel lists the individual questions. For example, a few of them are kind of funny now that we know the history that happened. If Russia beats Germany, will not Russia dominate and direct any future German revolution, giving it a communist turn, and if the new China and the new India turn communism, turn towards communism, as some Chinese and Indian leaders threaten, will not communism then dominate the world? Right? So, you know, China turned to communism, but India didn't. Uh, 
And interestingly enough, at the time, America was actually not all that, was kind of had misgivings against Britain for, uh, because America at the time had uh, anti-colonialist leanings. You can see one of John's questions are, uh, are our boys finding in India, Burma, Ceylon, Africa to give those countries democracy or to maintain the British Empire in those parts? Why are we defending the empire in Australia, New Zealand, and Africa, and Ireland, and many other places, when our forefathers fought to, to be free from it and did their best to destroy it? So that's a bit strange. <sighs> well, not strange. I mean, it was the idea at the time, but it's strange to us in nowadays because uh, America is now considerably more uh, imperialistic than it was. Can John do anything about it? Chapter 2. So essentially... Norman Angel goes through the idea. He dispels both the uh, ideas of sort of more conservative groups that we need to maintain, um, that we need to stay out because this is uh, Britain and we need to fight. Like this is an imperialist war and it's uh, irrelevant to us, right? He said that it is relevant to us, to America, and as well he um, argued against the revolutionary socialist, Norman Angel was a democratic socialist, he argued against the revolutionary socialist who said it was all uh, a problem of the bourgeoisie and that until um, they claimed, the revolutionary socialists, that until there was a proper revolution and not a state capitalist revolution, right, like under Stalin in the USSR, we could not uh, fight because it's just a war of the bourgeoisie and not a, a workers party war. But here, uh, Norman Angel was claiming why it is a people's war. This is our war, the people's. For this is the people's war in a very simple and obvious way. If the Nazis and our allies succeed, the mass of men everywhere will be governed by a small oligarchy or feudal order, whose law would be simply their commands, the governed having little or nothing to say about it. Essentially what he, he was proposing is a revival of the um, sort of League of Nations order of the world. In fact, uh, while the League of Nations was still alive, he was um, in, he was uh, pretty strongly affiliated with it. He sort of promoted it all the time. Um, and essentially what happens is he proposes a world cooperation between countries, not a world government, which is very interesting. He proposes that all countries band together in mutual defense, so that if any country is invaded by another, um, all the countries unite with the victim country against the other country. His main argument is that uh, Hitler's Germany was able to pick off small nations one by one because other European nations were saying, oh, well, it's not our war, right? They're just invading, I don't know, Czechoslovakia. So he was able to get them easily, right? And uh, because they went one by one, Germany grew larger. But if all those countries of Europe had been united against Germany, as they are pretty much now, but he's saying it's too late, that they could have done it in the 30s and prevented Hitler's domination of Europe, then there would have been peace in the world. And in fact, that's basically the foundation of international law today, um, is that uh, sort of um, wars of aggression are now illegal again by international law. And there we go. He's saying that it's not a banker's war. His claim was that it's not a banker's war and it's not an imperialist war. It's just a war to prevent... Uh, it's a war that was caused chiefly by the peoples of the West's des desire or lack of desire to defend their free compatriots in Europe. And therefore that's why they allowed, in his claim, Germany to become much larger. And thus they now have to fight against it. So if they had united earlier, this would not have happened. You can see, the central truth which uses a guiding policy might have saved the world from a second world war is in itself simple. And though no panacea insufficient of itself to save us is indispensable, there can be no salvation unless we do understand it. It is often difficult of practical application, which is why widescreen comprehension of it is so important. And here's where he describes the idea of mutual defense and how he actually talked uh, about... Um, here we go. Most immediately, there are multiple forms in which the social principle can be stated. Perhaps the form most immediately uh, to coming present war, present no nation in the modern world can possibly defend itself effectively against a form of cycle, most likely to defend itself unless prepared to take its part in the defense of others. By refusing to concern ourselves with the defense of others, we make our own impossible. 
that's essentially his thesis for the entire book. Sort of a moral and uh, uh, moral and pragmatic idea. And he talks about how he talked with uh, French and British and American leaders uh, during the negotiations of the Treaty of Versailles. And you know, he he acknowledges that France was kind of insane about. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles, that they wanted to just shut down Germany, not because they, they really hated Germany, but because they didn't want Germany to rise up again, right? Because they didn't, because they knew they couldn't dis defend themselves again, right, against such a strong Germany. So they wanted to make them as weak as possible. But the thing is, that very weakness turned Germany against France and caused the Second World War. So essentially what happens is he claims that uh, these constant, you know, conquering, making weak, but then the weak nation becomes strong and tries to get its revenge, just constant cycles of revenge fuel international uh, conflict. Of course, it's interesting to note that um, the, uh, he also argues against so-called pacifists who don't go to war to defend victims and that thus become victims of aggression themselves at some point. So. It's interesting because, uh, as we can see, uh, either his implementation has been inconsistent or uh, implementation of the system in international law has been inconsistent because we still have wars of aggression that aren't, uh, how do you call them, defended against by all the other countries, right? And of course we have one country which has a leading role rather than all countries having about an equal role in this sort of stuff, which is the United States. So you could say he's a bit of an idealist, and that's what his critics called him, an idealist socialist. Um, and in fact, it's very interesting, he argues for um, democratic socialist reform in America, similar to what happened in Britain. He, again, he was a labor MP. Here we go, he talks a, a note on the social revolution in Britain. And he reproduces um, an observation of Dr. Stolper with the British financial commercial policy. Um, and you see, here's appendix. A note on Britain's social progress. Essentially, he talks about uh, financing and funding of the w new welfare programs just I instituted sort of after the First World War in Britain. Uh, it goes through a very long sort of manuscript type thing. It's very interesting to see. Um, it shows the exact nature of these uh, welfare uh, systems and how they actually work to benefit the people, how you know, people actually benefited it and how much it cost and all that. Very interesting stuff. So essentially, this book, I guess it's fairly rare, I couldn't find a version of it online, so you'd have to buy it from somewhere. But if you do get it, I would highly recommend it because it shows a certain perspective that we don't get nowadays. It shows the perspective of the early 20th century of idealist democratic socialist. It seems, uh, I guess, even optimists to some extent. Uh, so, if you do have, uh, uh, if you do find it, uh, I'd buy it. I bought it for about two dollars. You could probably get it for a bit more expensive on eBay or something if you can find it. And, yeah, you can see what this class of people thought at the time. It's like a window into their mind. Very good stuff. Highly recommended. And that's it for the first review.